Yeah, as Michael said, I'm a security and privacy researcher. And I'm here today to share something cool with you, but also to ask you for help. What I want to tell you about is a problem in, uh, that comes up in the Bitcoin space on designing for usable security. And I want to tell you why it's important. I'll tell you why it's important, even if you don't care about Bitcoin at all, why it has repercussions well outside the Bitcoin world. And I'll tell you why the community is a little bit stuck right now in trying to solve this problem, despite a number of creative ideas. Oops, how about that? That was my fault. This is it working now? <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> And this is something that I think would really benefit from the expertise of uh, uh, people who have a background in human-computer interaction. It's something that I'd love to collaborate on, for example, but it's something for you to uh, be aware of as an interesting research problem if you're uh, thinking along these lines. So what am I talking about? Let me start by giving you just a very quick five-minute introduction to Bitcoin. And these, you know, this very simplified uh, view of Bitcoin is all that you'll need for understanding everything that I'm talking about today. So the first thing to know about Bitcoin is that Bitcoins uh, don't, the Bitcoin system doesn't have accounts like you have bank accounts. Instead, what you have is that Bitcoins are owned by addresses. And this is a good example of this. Here you see the WikiLeaks donation page. And there's a lot of text on this page, but what I want to draw your attention to is this uh, string over here. And the same information that's represented as a 2D barcode over here. So what WikiLeaks is saying is send us Bitcoins, and in particular, send Bitcoins to this address. Right. And so why is this address so long? Why is it not a, a human readable or human memorable thing? Why does it have to be gibberish? Well, that's because addresses are, in fact, public keys. So the first thing to understand about the Bitcoin system is that money is sent to and from these public keys. And all that the system itself cares about is how to take care of the transfer of money from one public key to another. The Bitcoin system uh, has no idea that this string over here corresponds to WikiLeaks. It doesn't care about that. That is completely external to the system. Okay, so why does it have to be public keys? Well, it turns out that there is an important cryptographic significance to that. Having your addresses be public keys and having money be transferred to and from public keys allows you to do something really cool. It allows you to say that in the Bitcoin system, transfers of money are merely signed cryptographic statements. So what does it mean to make a transaction in Bitcoin? What does it mean for me to send you money? Or what does it mean for me to send WikiLeaks some money? All that it means is that I would create a statement. A statement is just a string. Uh, that says, my address A would like to transfer a coin C, which, is, which has some identifier, let's say, also a string, uh, to some other address B. So I create that string, I create that statement, and I sign it with the private key that corresponds to my public address. Right? So you might know from cryptography public-private key pairs. So I create a key pair. Anybody can create a key pair, as many as they want, at any time. And your public key becomes the address from which you send money or to which people send you money. And the corresponding secret key that you keep secret, intuitively, it sort of allows the sender to speak for the corresponding address. So what does that mean? If somebody sees a statement out there, a string that's signed by a private key, and they can verify that this private key corresponds to some address, then they know that the statement was authorized by someone who, has the, uh, who controls that particular address, who controls the bitcoins at those address. So this cryptographic statement itself becomes all that you need in order to spend bitcoins from that address. Right? So what happens in the bitcoin system is simply these signed statements floating around. And the only thing that the bitcoin network itself cares about is keeping track, keeping a ledger of all of the statements of the sort that have been made and putting them in a public ledger, which is called the blockchain, uh, which I'm sure you've heard about. Right? So conceptually, it's an extremely simple currency system. You've got these cryptographic statements that authorize transfers of money from one address to another address. And all of these statements are recorded in the blockchain. That's it. So visually, it might look something like this. If Alice is sending some money, she creates the statement over there on the left. She creates a signature that happens on her device, and she broadcasts it to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network. It's a network of uh, thousands of nodes. And notice that she, she might be sending her, her money to Bob or WikiLeaks or whoever, but that person is not even in the picture here. The recipient, it's not as if the recipient's computer is involved in any way. 
the transfer of money to somebody merely involves a statement asserting that transfer being recorded uh, by this public network in the blockchain. Right. So that's basically all you need to know about how Bitcoin works. But here's the interesting thing, and here's where uh, the whole security challenge comes from. Alice's device on which, you know, her computer or her phone or whatever, on which she creates the signed statement, on which she controls her secret key or uh, secret keys corresponding to one or more addresses, that becomes a single point of failure. If she has malware on her device, that malware can steal all her keys and she loses her entire um, you know, uh, Bitcoin uh, wallet, as we call it. And that's a problem. This is a problem because this is very much unlike, for example, how banking security works. Right? There are some key differences. Uh, in, a, in a banking transaction, there is a human in the loop. There is a tra the transaction can be reversed. It's not instantaneous. All of this is a, uh, as opposed to Bitcoin, where if somebody gets a hold of uh, your key or keys, you've permanently and irreversibly and instantaneously lost your Bitcoins. Right, so software has never before been the sole line of defense when it comes to security, and perhaps for the first time uh, it is being put in this position, at least when it comes to financial security. And the result has been, I would say, complete disaster. Look at this. Here is a list of uh, all the uh, pro most prominent hacks and thefts and losses in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And if you look on the right-hand column, you can see the US dollars equivalent of the uh, uh, Bitcoin value that was stolen, right? I mean, Bitcoin in terms of total monetary value is only a $5 billion system. So a large fraction of all the Bitcoins that have ever been in existence have been stolen at least once. Right? That is an absurd statistic. And here is another crazy statistic to go along with that. There is a 2013 study that looked at a number of Bitcoin exchanges where you can convert dollars into Bitcoins and vice versa and showed that 45% of them over the uh, three-year observation period had been uh, hacked at least once, hacked or taken down or something like that. Right? So this is seriously problematic. Having your keys that reside on your computer control your Bitcoins is kind of insane from a financial security point of view. Kaspersky Labs estimates that there are hundreds of strains of malware, which the first thing they do when they infect your computer is to look to see if, they have, if you have Bitcoin private keys on them, and if so, steal them instantaneously. Right, so this is a problem. It's, it's a clearly a security problem. People are uh, having their Bitcoin stolen all the time. It's also a usability problem. People simply forget where they store their Bitcoin private keys. And this sort of story happens a lot. This is one of my favorites. Right, so this guy had four million pounds worth of Bitcoins that he had obtained when Bitcoin was a fledgling currency and so it was not worth a lot in value. But then later, uh, it gradually grew and appreciated in value. And he just forgot that he had his Bitcoin private keys on this computer and only on this computer. He had not backed them up anywhere. Ended up in a landfill and he even uh, went to the city government, went to the press to try to tell his story to see, to try to see if he can convince somebody to uh, try to search the landfill. But of course that was not, didn't turn out to be feasible and he lost them forever. Right, so it's a huge security and usability problem. And so I actually want to see if you have any ideas for um, what one can do to improve the situation, either for security or usability-wise, or both. And I'm going to go through a bunch of those ideas, but I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Well, I mean, aren't like certain companies like like, cloud, like, like Coinbase like doing things like we, we take your, your, we manage your wallet okay. in cloud? That's a good point. You can outsource the storage of your Bitcoins to somebody else. Uh, it becomes a question then, if uh, you you can really be thought of as using bitcoins at all in this situation, or if if that's just like using PayPal, right? Because one of the main reasons you might want to use bitcoins is so that you have financial privacy. If you're paying someone, uh, nobody's tracking that transaction. There's no link between your real life identity and your bitcoin address. So when you is that something most people will care about? That's a good question, but I think to the extent that people are adopting Bitcoin, which is still you know, a, a fairly niche thing, it's because a lot, a big fraction of that small population is interested in the privacy properties. Are you trying to optimize for that population, or are you trying to optimize for like making Bitcoin go broader across like people who, who may not be in that early adopter? Sure, I think, uh, you know, uh, so personally, I would say I'll take whatever we can get out of this, right? So there are uh, three different dimensions, security, privacy, and usability. Uh, can you, is it even possible to achieve all three? I think it's potentially possible. We don't have a solution to that yet. But if we can have a really good solution for just security and usability, that would already be pretty good. 
But even if you're outsourcing the storage of your Bitcoins, it's not an automatic solution to the security problem because notice that these are exchanges where people had outsourced the storage of their Bitcoins and even those guys had not managed to solve the security problem even though you'd hope that they would have security professionals there. So it's, you know, it, it helps a little bit. You, know, you don't need to teach a million people how to secure their Bitcoins, only maybe 100 exchanges, but you still do have a smaller version of that problem. But yes, good point. Evan. You could, uh, see, the problem that you mentioned is that we don't have a human in the loop, that, that there's no one who's actually officiating these transactions. Uh -huh. um, I know that there are a lot of shared secret protocols in... Oh, Bitcoin. excellent, excellent. Yeah. So yeah. we could have some central, like a bank, let's say, of Bitcoin or whatever, mm -hmm. and they have half your shared secret, you have the other half. No one can make the transaction without both parties being... Nice, nice. nice. We're going to talk about that too. That it is a solution that people are considering. It's a little bit tricky to make the uh, crypto work out, but uh, we will talk about that. Other other suggestions, solutions? Yeah. Maybe just store a copy of your private key encrypted with your with some password in your backup so that you don't lose your private key. Okay. <laughs> Very good. We'll talk about that too. Excellent. Okay. Um, so let me go through a list of uh, solutions that people have tried to come up with. And before talking about these, I just want to introduce one term, which is the notion of a Bitcoin wallet. And so the idea here is that you're not just going to have one pr Bitcoin private key. You typically want to have numerous addresses. You gain some privacy out of this. You hope that people can't link these addresses together. And so you, you'll definitely need software that's going to manage all of these for you. And that's called a Bitcoin wallet. So one cool idea that people have come up with is to separate their Bitcoin private keys into what is called hot storage and cold storage. And this is analogous to the following. If you have a lot of assets in cash, you'd want to keep most of that cash locked in a safe and only carry a little bit to spend every day in your wallet. And this is a, a very similar concept. You can, spend your, you can uh, separate your Bitcoin assets into various private keys, and most of your assets will stay in let's say in a USB drive locked in a safe, and only a little bit that you want to spend every day will be on your computer and accessible at all times, but also more insecure because it could be um, hacked over the network. So one key concept here is that when people separate their assets into hot and cold storage, uh, they'll, what they'll want to do is they'll want to have an automated process, ideally, so that when your balance in your hot storage goes above some amount, say more than 100 bitcoins, and you definitely don't want to be spending that on a daily basis, you automatically transfer the rest of it to the cold storage. On the other hand, to take money out of cold storage, you want to make sure that it's a carefully controlled and audited process. So, Wait a minute though, how is it possible to automatically transfer your Bitcoins to a USB device that's locked in a safe? How does that make any sense? How could that be automated? What am I talking about here? Yes? Um, I guess you have, the, you have a bunch of public keys for uh -huh. the private keys that are on the USB drive. Uh -huh. You don't need the private keys to transfer to cold storage. Exactly, exactly. So to transfer to the, the cold storage, you don't need the private keys of the cold storage. Bitcoins are sent to addresses, and these addresses are public keys. And recall from this uh, previous picture that I showed you that sending Bitcoins to some, uh, some address or some device doesn't involve the recipient in any way. Uh, if, you want, if you're sending Bitcoins uh, to that safe, metaphorically, what you're actually doing is broadcasting that fact to thousands of computers all over the world, but are ironically not to the device that's stored in the safe itself. Right? So that's a, a cryptographic concept to keep in mind. But yeah, this is the idea behind separating it into hot storage and cold storage. Small amount of money in easily accessible but more insecure format, large amount of money in less accessible but more secure format. So what's the next idea here? Another cool idea is a hardware wallet. Here, the idea is that if you put your Bitcoins in a hardware device whose functionality is hard-coded into hardware or firmware, and it doesn't have a general purpose operating system, maybe it's not so easy for that device to get hacked. Right, and so you could have an interface like this. If you want to spend some money, uh, the only thing that this uh, hardware device is programmed to do is show you an alert uh, with the amount of money and the address to which you want to send your Bitcoins. And then if you confirm, it will um, actually create the signature and authorize that transaction. The device doesn't even have any other functionality, so it can't possibly be used to do anything else, such as extract the private key. Yeah. It doesn't solve the problem of losing the device, right? Oh, good point. Yes, let's come to that. So this seems to, you know, it, it seems to solve the problem of malware, but it seems that the problem of losing the device is still just as severe as in the earlier case. But I'm claiming that it's not. 
Here's what I'm claiming is possible. Uh, this is a particular screenshot of a particular company. I don't know specifically what their product does, but here's what is something you can generally do with secure hardware. You can program a hard, pre-programmed hard-coded limit into the device saying that you're only allowed to spend, let's say, one Bitcoin per day maximum unless uh, a specific PIN or password is entered and this limit is erased. Right? So you put that device in that state and let's say the device is stolen now and let's say you have 100 Bitcoins on that device and the device is programmed with a spending limit of one Bitcoin per day. So you might think that, oh, this doesn't help you very much. And instead of losing all your Bitcoins at once, you have the satisfaction of gradually seeing your dwindling assets over a period of 100 days and being able to do nothing about it. But I'm claiming that that's not the case. Why is that? Yes? Revocation key? Yeah. Revocation key, interesting. Um, so there you are perhaps imagining some way to uh, send a certificate or revocation certificate uh, to the device, which if it receives that, it'll try to self-destruct. It's possible. There's a much, much simpler approach, though. Any ideas? OK. You have to have a backup of that public key somewhere in cold storage, and then just retrieve that USB key and just transfer all of your That's stuff. exactly right. So the fact that your private keys are on that device doesn't preclude them from residing anywhere else. So you could have a backup in cold storage, and so while the thief is limited to spending one Bitcoin per day. And remember that all of these Bitcoin transactions are on the public blockchain, so you could easily set up an alert that scans the blockchain every day and sends you an email alert if a transaction has been made from that address. So you notice that, and you immediately take out your key from cold storage and transfer all of those Bitcoins to a different address that you control. Yeah. So this could be a pretty good solution. Okay, here's another one, and this is, I think, also uh, one that has already been suggested, which is to encrypt your wallet file with, your, uh, with a password that you pick. So here, again, we sort of uh, seem to have a trade-off. This will protect you against the stolen device, uh, hopefully, but it doesn't protect you against malware at all. Why does it not protect you against malware? Because you'll have to... I think you were going to guess uh, what I was going to say anyway, which is that you'll probably have to enter the password on the device itself so the malware can uh, do some key logging and steal your wallet file at that point. So, but here's the thing. Even the protection against a stolen device ends up being pretty limited in this scenario. It's not super helpful because we know that people have a tendency to pick weak passwords, which I think you may have already known about from Laurie Craner's work, uh, who uh, I hear visited here recently. And one of the things she's most famous for is studying how people pick passwords. And this is her dress that's, that she created that has the most common passwords on them. Right? So it's, it's really a tough ask to ask people to pick passwords that are strong enough that they will resist an offline attack. What does that mean? What is an offline attack? So in the situation where you have your wallet file on your computer, it's encrypted with your password, somebody steals your computer, what they're going to be able to do is they're going to be able to look at that encrypted file, try billions of passwords per second. They're, they've even developed specialized hardware for password cracking purposes. And so your password will have to be strong enough that it must resist at least billions, possibly even trillions of guesses. This is very different from a scenario where you're using a password to log into a website where after three or ten or whatever number of guesses, uh, the attacker is going to get logged out of the website. So that's called an online attack, and most of us can pick passwords that can resist an online attack. Very few of us can pick passwords that can resist an offline attack and still remember them conveniently. Right. So in the, in the security community, and the usable security community, getting people to pick passwords that do resist offline attacks is considered... Uh, a very hard problem, and so it's, I, I would say this is of somewhat limited use. I should point out one caveat, though. There's a cool feature in iOS that you may or may not know about, and I think Android will also eventually get it. And here's that cool feature. If you enable um, a, a pin for iOS, and I think there's also an additional setting that's in fact turned on by default, uh, your whole disk is encrypted with that pin or with that password, but with an additional property. The additional property is that trying different passwords to decrypt your device can only be done using what is called a secure coprocessor that resides on your iPhone. So even if somebody gets a, hand, uh, gets a hold of your iPhone, they can't simply copy all the disk contents to another device and try passwords at billions of times per second. That is simply not possible unless they can overcome the tamper resistance of that hardware. And tamper resistant hardware is intended to destroy itself before it will give up its secrets. So this is a very cool technique that exists in uh, 
uh, iOS as well as in the uh, iPhone hardware that allows you to force attackers to try passwords in an online fashion as opposed to an offline fashion. And also the iPhone is set to lock itself up after a certain number of failed guesses. So that method, if you have a device that supports that, if you have a device that forces the attacker to manually try guesses one by one, then encryption with a password becomes a really good security technique and it's also a really uh, usable technique because you can just get away with a short pen. You don't have to have a super complicated password. Yeah, so that's the key difference. Um, there's uh, a technique that's related to this. Instead of having a normal wallet file and encrypting it with a password, some people came up with this cool idea. Let's say that your password itself somehow acts as your Bitcoin private key. And that seems a bit crazy, but it's in fact doable with relatively simple algorithms. Uh, visually, this is how it would work. So you have a password. I know that all of you pick, like to pick this password. Uh, it's from XKCD. So you have an algorithm, a deterministic algorithm, that takes any given password and generates a private key from it. You also have an algorithm that sort of stretches one private key into a collection of as many different pub, uh, private keys as you want. And you also have a third algorithm that can take a private key and derive the corresponding public key from it. Right. And this, uh, this notion is called a brain wallet, the idea being that everything you need in order to spend your bitcoins is stored in your brain. And these, all of these three derivation algorithms are both deterministic and standardized and implemented in different pieces of software. And so this is a pretty cool idea. Uh, and uh, in fact, this is especially good fodder for sci-fi stories, where the idea being that the key to control uh, millions of dollars worth of bitcoins or, or how much ever you want is just in your brain. And so you can travel anywhere. You don't need to take any device with you. You can later acquire a device and install software that comes built in with these standardized public algorithms. All algorithms in crypto are public, and that will help you regenerate your Bitcoin wallet and take control of all of your Bitcoins. Pretty cool idea. Yeah, question. I'm just wondering, if two people have the same password, mm -hmm. wouldn't they be able to spend each other's money? Very interesting. So. Let's, let's think about that. So this is exactly the Achilles heel of the whole system, right? It's not only the case that if two people accidentally pick the same password, they'll be able to spend each other's money. How does it get even worse than that? Common passwords, like password one and two. Three. Right, so he, here's where, where it gets really crazy. So look, look at these functions. This is a deterministic function. Every arrow points to a deterministic function. And so if you have an attacker who's trying to guess passwords, they always have the ability to look at your public key that you've published, try passwords one by one, and brute force it using these publicly known functions to see if they hit the same public key. So this is not just offline guessing instead of online guessing. This is even a step further. With the same algorithm, the attacker can try to brute force everybody's brain wallets all at once. They don't even need to know who they're attacking. They can steal the money uh, you know, belonging to some anonymous person from the blockchain directly. Right? And here's where it gets really cool. So think about this for a second. So you've got these public addresses. And what this means is that corresponding to any of these, if you, if you generate any of these public addresses from a guessable password, it means that there are potentially attackers out there who can scan the blockchain, realize you know, what password it came from, uh, recreate the private key, and steal your bitcoins, right? So if that is the case, and if people are using this brain wallet software, and if they are generating these insecure passwords, you can expect pretty much with certainty that there are attackers out there that are scanning the blockchain at all times and try to see if this is happening. Right? So we did an experiment. Um, I wasn't too directly involved, but Joe Bonneau at Princeton, some other collaborators at uh, Michigan, one of my master's students was involved, to try to see if you can put small amounts of money into these addresses generated from insecure passwords and to see what happens. We found that they were getting stolen within three to five seconds. Right. If the password was sufficiently weak, it, the attackers actually weren't trying trillions of possible guesses, but if the password was weak enough, then they were stealing it. So, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a really neat idea, especially for sci-fi, but uh, it's, in, in the real world, I don't think it's that secure a technique, and I wouldn't recommend that anybody use it. So there's another similar one, so let me actually grab this. Uh, I have an example of this uh, here in my actual wallet. What I have is what is called a uh, paper wallet. 
So this is an example of a paper wallet with your public key that's encoded as a, a two-dimensional QR code. And this, this particular one was given out to all participants in a Bitcoin workshop. And so that's fine. So you're thinking, you know, it's just a way to encode your public key um, on a piece of paper and you can keep it in your wallet and hopefully you'll remember where it is. But the cool thing is that if you open up this sort of kind of tamper resistant part, then your private key pops out. So the idea is that um, if you sort of believe in the, uh, uh, in the tamper resistance of this, you can, and if you trust the person who created this paper wallet, right, the company or whoever who uh, created this paper wallet, you can just order one on the internet and you can keep it around and you can go around, you know, I don't know, maybe asking people for donations and when you want to retrieve your money, you can pop open the private key and hopefully you never use your paper wallet again. So that's the paper wallet idea. I, I think it's cute, but really in a, in a practical sense, it's not really all that useful. It's a neat gimmick, but it's not gonna really buy you that much. <laughs> right, so definitely don't send any money to this address or try sending money to this address and see if it does get stolen within three to five seconds. That's also another experiment you can do. We had uh, in the Bitcoin uh, lecture series that we did, Ed Felton uh, did a lecture where he covered many of these ideas that we're talking about and um, he flashed something and said, hey, here's a Bitcoin public key. Feel free to donate some Bitcoins to us. And we actually got some Bitcoin donations out of that. We haven't done anything with it, but it was, it was pretty cool to see that. Uh, we didn't flash the private key, though, just the public key. OK, so let's look at another idea, which has already been suggested and discussed, which is a hosted wallet. And the idea here is just it, you just outsource the storage of your Bitcoins to some company. And I think this example is from Coinbase. It shows you a list of account or wallets that you have and the uh, uh, balances that each of them contains, the list of all the transactions you've made, yada, 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 everything that you'd expect, exactly like PayPal. Right. So again, the question becomes, are you really benefiting from the privacy and other features of Bitcoin if you're using a hosted wallet? And again, are you going to really want to trust the security to uh, these companies, given that this is not such a mature and regulated space as of yet, uh, unlike, uh, unlike traditional banking, and a lot of these tend to close down. But it's something interesting to consider. Okay. Now let's get to some pretty neat ideas that involve some uh, somewhat novel security techniques that many of you may not have seen. So one big problem with everything that we've talked about so far is that very often there is a single point of failure. Even if you have a hot wallet, cold wallet separation, your hot wallet itself, even if it has only a little money, is a single point of failure. So how can you avoid that? How can you do better than that? Roughly speaking, there are two different ways to avoid a single point of failure. One is you have your Bitcoin private key and you somehow split that key between multiple devices. And the other approach is you can use a feature of Bitcoin itself called multi-signatures that allows you to designate, to tell the Bitcoin network that this address is not a regular address. It's not protected by a single private key. It's protected by a sort of a quorum of private keys. And here are the different public keys corresponding to them and only accept transactions originating from this address if at least a certain minimum number of those private keys come together and all sign, the, sign that transaction. Right? So roughly, uh, this is what I'm talking about. This is called Bitcoin multi-signature. So you can associate n different keys with that address. And this is two out of three, so you've associated three different public keys with that address, and you've specified a threshold, in this case two, of keys that need to sign in order to be able to spend a transaction from that address. And the Bitcoin network will ensure this. If there's malware on one of your devices and somebody tries to sp uh, spend a transaction from that address with only one of those signatures, the network will simply reject it. And so the, uh, one of the useful special cases of this is just the two out of two case. And in a two out of two uh, multi-signature, what you're doing is you're splitting your key or, or you designate two different keys, one of which is on your computer and one of which is on your phone. And so uh, you'd initiate a transaction on your computer and you'd have to confirm it on your phone. And if there's malware on any one of these devices, you're still okay. So people have gotten farther with this. There's a hybrid model where you can outsource part of your security to another company and keep control uh, um, of it yourself uh, in, a, in an important way at the same time. A little bit of having your cake and eating it too. And what am I talking about here? So again, you can utilize multi-signatures. But what you do is 
you protect your addresses with a two out of three multi-signature. And of those three keys, you keep two for yourself. You keep one of them in hot storage and you keep one of them in cold storage. And the third one, you outsource to this company. So let's think about this for a minute. I'll ask you uh, two questions. Uh, the first is, what, what two keys will sign your transactions in your normal everyday course of spending? And the second question I'll ask you is, is there a way for you to recover um, if the uh, service, in fact, turns out to be malicious? Think about it for a minute, and then we'll look at the answers. OK, so here's the idea. In the normal everyday course of spending, your transactions would typically be authorized by these two keys, the key in your hot storage and the key that you've outsourced to the service provider. The key in your cold storage, you don't want to take it out in the normal course of things, obviously. So why is this better? What does this buy you compared to just having one key on your own computer? Now, one thing that the service provider might do by default is simply authorize, simply sign every transaction that's requested in this fashion. Right? So in that situation, it would more or less be identical to having just one key on your own computer. You're not really using the capabilities of the multi-signature here. Why? Because if your hot storage is compromised, the attacker would initiate a transaction, the uh, service provider would go ahead and rubber stamp it, and then the attacker would be able to steal all your bitcoins uh, from hot storage. However, we can do better than that. You can set a spending limit with the uh, uh, website, for example. And this is similar to the spending limit with the hardware protection that I was talking about. You could say, uh, you should only authorize the spending of one Bitcoin per day, and they'd say, OK, and they would freeze, uh, you know, they would stop creating signatures after that limit is reached. And the only way you'd be able to overcome this limit, let's say, would be to call them on the phone, authenticate who you are, and say you want to raise that limit. So that puts you at a different level of security. Um, you could also do other things. Every time a transaction request is initiated, the service provider has to call you on the phone and confirm that transaction. Right? But notice that this is absolutely not the same as outsourcing your security altogether to the cloud provider. Why? Because it's two out of three multi-signatures, so the service provider themselves has no ability to steal your funds. And if you ever lose your confidence in them, in fact, you can simply uh, forget about uh, their key. You can use your two keys, take your key out of cold storage, and then move your funds somewhere else. So this is an interesting hybrid model. Now, I said there are two ways to avoid a single point of failure. One is to use this feature of the Bitcoin protocol to designate multiple keys. And the other is you just have a single key, but you somehow split your key. This is something that uh, I'm guessing most of you have not seen. And this is a very neat idea called Shamir secret sharing. It uses some interesting properties of algebra. And let me show you what this is. So here is a cool protocol. This was invented in 1979, and this is still one of the fundamental techniques in crypto for how to take a piece of information and split it into different devices with some very specific properties. What are the properties that we want? Let's say we want to do a two out of three secret sharing of my key. So what that means is that if I bring any two of those three shares, as we call them, if I bring together any two of those shares of the key, I should be able to reconstruct the whole key. But if I only have one share, then that should give me no information whatsoever about the key. Having one share should not make it any easier to guess the key than if I had known nothing at all. And so this should make it clear that the obvious solution of just concatenating the key into some number of pieces and putting them on different devices is simply not going to work. Why? Because in that situation, knowing one share does give you some information about the key. Right? So it's not obvious what to do. But there's a clever mathematical trick you can apply. And let me show you that. So this is going to involve some algebra, which I'm going to show you visually in a geometric form. So here's how to split a key. So you represent your key k as the point 0, comma k over here on the y-axis. So your key is going to be some 128-bit number. Let's say you just treat it as a giant number, and you just put plot that point here uh, on this graph over here. Right? So you know it, it, we're doing this on the computer, so it, it doesn't matter. This is, but this is k is going to be a giant number, a 128-bit number. Okay. So now you want to split the key into a bunch of different pieces. Here's the next step. You draw a line with a random slope through that point. Why are we doing that? It'll become clear in a second. So you draw a line with a random slope, and then you pick some arbitrary point on that line. 
And that point, the x comma y pair of that point is going to be one of the shares. And you can give it to one device or one person or one friend, whatever you want to think of it. You pick a different arbitrary point on that line, you give it to somebody else. So what properties does this have? If these two people come together, they can draw the line, they can intercept that with the y-axis, they can figure out the value of k. But if you have only one person who's malicious, who's trying to infer what the secret was based on the point that they have, then they have literally no information about what k is because we picked a random slope. It could be any line through that point. So that line could intersect the y-axis at any point whatsoever. So a single person has learned nothing, and you can keep doing this. You can give out as many shares as you like. Any two of those people can come together and learn that point, uh, but any individual among them will not be able to do so. It's a pretty cool property. So here I've showed you two out of n secret sharing. You can go further and you can do uh, m out of n secret sharing for any m and n. So this is, uh, we believe that this has some important advantages over uh, designating uh, with the Bitcoin protocol that you want to use different keys to protect your wallet. And in fact, I'm giving a, a talk about, uh, we did a lot of crypto to actually make this work with the Bitcoin protocol. This simple thing has been known since 1979, but it's not, it's not all that you need. I'll show you in the next slide. And what is the additional thing that you need? That's some research that we did. And I'm going to be giving a talk about it at the security seminar today at 4.15 if you're interested. That's going to be a complete crypto talk. Uh, I'm going to show the math behind how a lot of this stuff works, uh, just letting you know if you're interested. So yeah, this idea is pretty simple. Given any two points, you can interpolate and find k. So why is this not enough? Why do you need additional crypto to make this work? Well, here's the problem. I've shown you how to split the key, but I haven't shown you how to spend a transaction. Because when you do want to create a transaction, what are you going to do? Are you going to reconstruct the key in a single place? Let's say you've split it between your computer and your phone. Or are you going to reconstruct the entire key on one of those two devices? Well, that's not going to work because the device that you choose to reconstruct it on could be infected with malware. And at that point, you've given away your key. And so you haven't really gained anything in terms of security. So this is where uh, the crypto magic comes in that I was talking about. What we have is something called a threshold signature protocol. And if you haven't heard of that, it's pretty cool. So here's what I'm claiming. There's a secret key. It's not stored on any individual one of the devices, but shares of this key are stored on, let's say, three different devices. And what you can have is a protocol where these three different devices come together, and there's a series of communication between them. And at the end of the day, they've managed to construct a signature that's signed by that private key that's not, in fact, stored on any single one of those devices. And they've managed to do it without reconstructing the key on any individual device at any one time. So it seems a bit crazy. It seems a bit magical. But there's a lot of crypto behind it. And let me just quickly show you what the user interface behind that would look like. This is something we've implemented. Um, so you would initiate a transaction on your computer. It would confirm that you want to send something. And it's going to show you the address that you want to send it to and uh, the amount of the transaction and so on. And so once you click uh, send or confirm or whatever, a notification will pop up on your phone, which will include uh, the uh, same parameters that you saw on the previous screen. And your job would be to make sure that both of these devices are showing you the same information. Because if those two pieces of information didn't match, it could mean that one of your computers or one of your devices is compromised and you could be sending money to the attacker instead of whoever you wanted, wanted to send it to. But you know, we and the others who are working on these problems, we're doing it with no uh, real background or training in usability and design and so on. I can already think of many different problems with this, many reasons why this is a suboptimal flow for users. Here's one simple example. Look at that gibberish address over there, right? So if you had the task of comparing these two addresses between these two different devices, most likely what you would do is you'd look for the first several characters and see if they matched or not. Right? So cryptographically, you're guaranteed that no attacker will be able to generate a malicious address that matches uh, your address in its entirety. But there's nothing preventing them from trying a lot of different addresses until they can generate an address that matches yours in the first four or six characters. So that's a serious security vulnerability. So a good design question is how do you help users compare these complex sequences of crypto numbers and digits in a way that doesn't uh, pose a significant cognitive tax and in a way that helps them be secure? Anyway, this is the, uh, that interface, and it has some advanced properties that I'll skip over right now. 
But uh, the bigger point that I want to make is that in this whole space, design expertise is really desperately needed. There's some preliminary work, uh, there, the, that's the first author's name over there, this is a screenshot from a paper where they compared many, not all, but many of the techniques that we've talked about today, and they examined them on different directions. They came up with a, a bunch of properties that are useful for security and usability. Is it resistant to malware? And over here, you know, how usable it is to users. Uh, a variety of different properties, and they just did an analysis based on the descriptions of these techniques. What they did not do is an actual usability study. They did not go to users and see how comprehensible each of these were, how usable they were, whether or not users are good at, uh, uh, at keeping their Bitcoin secure. So the big open question to me that all of this really leads to is uh, what I like to call human crypto interaction. I want to ask the question, is human crypto interaction even possible? That is, can we ever, will, we, will the security community manage to uh, make it easy enough for users and to teach users to securely store and manage their keys? And this is n n not something really that's ever happened so far. The reason that web encryption is easy today and all of us do it in HTTPS is because it's completely transparent. And the only thing, if anything, that you know to, need to know to look for is whether there's a green lock icon in your browser. Right. And similarly, email security is gradually mo question. You think uh, your finger can be a security? Like, how do fingerprints play into um, the security of like, modern cryptography? That's a good question. So, uh, when I teach uh, biometric security, I tell my students that there are three things they need to remember about biometrics. Number one, biometrics are not secret. Number two, biometrics are not secret. Number three, biometrics are not secret. So this is really the key to understanding biometric security, that ironically biometrics are not secret. So the reason that fingerprints can be potentially a secure way to open a door lock, for example, is not because, absolutely not because we assume that nobody can figure out what your fingerprint is. It's very easy, you know, that especially with the camera resolutions these days, you can even imagine taking a picture of somebody from a distance and reconstructing their fingerprint. Uh, and there are lots of security papers that try to do uh, exactly things like these. However, however, the reason that a biometric door lock is supposed to be secure is that it's supposed to have sensors in there that ideally is able to figure out if it's a real life finger being presented or if it's a fake fingerprint that somebody has printed out on a piece of paper. Right? And if the biometric door lock succeeds at that task, precisely that task of liveness detection, Liveness detection is exactly the security property that you need for biometrics, not secrecy. So it's a completely different security principle, uh, not dependent on secrecy, but dependent on um, uh, liveness detection. So that's the reason why it doesn't translate over so well to the Bitcoin world, because there is no way that you can ever uh, build a secure system by assuming that fingerprints are going to be uh, reasonably kept secret. But yeah, that's a good point. So, so this is sort of the big question that I uh, kind of want to end with. If you look at other domains of cryptography, for example, the reason that web encryption works is that we've managed to make it completely invisible. We've managed to make it so that you don't have to go and manually install certificates or anything like that in your browser. It's because the only thing you need to know is to check for the green lock icon. And even then, we've ha we have a 10% penetration of people learning to check that accurately, right? And something like that, but it's getting better. Um, similarly, in email encryption, uh, Apple iMessage, for example, is end-to-end -end encrypted. What does that mean? It's not just encrypted between your mobile device and Apple's cloud server. It's in fact encrypted all the way from your mobile device to the mobile device of the recipient. So Apple, even if they wanted, are not in a position to intercept that encrypted communication. This is the reason, of course, that Silicon Valley has been absolutely at loggerheads with law enforcement in the last couple of years. Right? The FBI and lots of other law enforcement agencies uh, want backdoors into end-to-end -end encrypted communication precisely for this reason. This is not in the Gmail security model where the communication is encrypted from your computer to Gmail server where potentially law enforcement can go uh, serve Google with a subpoena to get at your emails. This is a different model, encrypted all the way from your computer to the recipient's computer. In the past, we thought that this was going to be essentially impossible uh, to achieve in a transparent fashion because people have to exchange each other's public keys and so on and so forth. And people came up with all kinds of crazy ideas. Key signing parties where a bunch of people come together and physically verify each other's keys and produce uh, digital signatures of them and so on. I've heard that this is very popular in Europe. Um, <laughs> 
but but it, it looks like that's not the uh, that's not the route that's winning users. The route that's winning users is to make it completely invisible. People do, are not even aware that they're using encrypted messaging, and the reason that that's possible is that specifically with messaging. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, technical uh, security detail, but if you're interested, the key difference that enables this is that unlike email, it's not an asynchronous communication. Texting is a synchronous communication. Both devices are online at the same time, so you can execute a secure key exchange protocol uh, through which these two users who've never talked before can exchange keys with each other. It doesn't get us all the security properties that it want, uh, that we want. Uh, people often call it tofu security. What that means is trust on first use security. So the security property that the system gives you is that you're still talking to the same person who you initiated the communication with, say, three months ago. Right? So that's still pretty good. That's still a reasonably good security property. It means that if somebody want, uh, wants to surveil your communication, they must have inserted, uh, inserted themselves into that communication the very first time you talk to your friend. So that's still a pretty good security property. And we have that working now. We have it working transparently. So in some domains, we've managed this. In the Bitcoin domain, security is clearly a huge problem. People are losing lots of money. There are interesting crypto ideas floating around, but making them usable and designing uh, for usability is still an open challenge. How are we going to do it? Are we going to make it completely invisible to users? Are we going to educate people to learn to uh, securely store and manage private keys, understand what they mean, and back them up appropriately, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, it's still unclear. There's a lot of scope for research here. So I wanted to end on that note. Let me know if you're interested in chatting more about this. All right, thank you. Please, yeah. Uh, one question I want to ask is, uh, you spoke about it being very difficult for humans to compare those keys, but sure. would it be any easier if the keys were shown as something like QR codes instead? Because yeah, that's, that's a great point. I don't, I don't necessarily know if it will be easier, but I think we should find the answer by testing it out. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs>